Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the RAS proteins. Okay, so we have discussed that there are four different types of RAS protein and that they all have a CAX box structure at their carboxyl terminus. Okay, and what happens is this CAX box gets farnesylated i.e. a farnesyl group is added on to the file group of the cysteine residue uh, within the CAX box, okay? And uh, then what follows is uh, the farnesyl group anchors the RAS protein, which was previously in the cytoplasm, into the cytoplasmic aspect of the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. And once the RAS protein is anchored into the cytoplasmic aspect of the ER membrane, enzymes which are in the membrane of the ER, uh, such as the RAS converting enzyme 1 and the isoprenyl cysteine carboxy uh, methyl transferase enzyme, can act on the RAS protein. Now, RAS converting enzyme 1 is going to um, participate in AAX uh, pro proteolysis, okay? So it's going to remove the final free amino acids from the po RAS polypeptide and hence make the cysteine residue the final amino acid in the RAS polypeptide. The protein isoprenyl cysteine carboxymethyl transferase is then going to transfer a methyl group onto uh, the alcohol group of the carboxylic acid group uh, that is now free on this now terminal cysteine residue, which has the farnesyl group on it. Okay, and both of these modifications, the AAX prote proteolysis followed by the transfer of a methyl group, uh, are considered post prenylation modifications of the protein. Now, once these two modifications have been made, the RAS protein is ready to leave uh, the ER membrane and move off. Okay, now, most of the RAS proteins require parmetylation to actually move any further, uh, but one of them does not. So we'll start off with the uh, odd one out, which does not require any parmetylation, and this is KRAS4B. Okay, so why does KRAS4B not require parmetylation to go from the ER membrane uh, to the plasma membrane? Okay, well the reason is that it has a very special domain known as the polybasic domain, okay, and this is within its hypervariable region. Okay, so let me remind you that if we have the uh, KRAS polypeptide here, or indeed any uh, RAS polypeptide, there is a region at the end which is known as the hypervariable region, or HVR for short, and this contains the CAX box. The CAX box, remember, is the final four amino acids. Okay, so the CAX box is within the hypervariable region, but there is some upstream amino acids, uh, upstream of the CAX box, which are also in this hypervariable region. Now, in the hypervariable region of the uh, KRAS B4, oh, sorry, 4B um, ends up uh, protein, and what you have are um, six lysine amino acids that are all next to each other. So basically, you have a string of lysine amino acids, and the single letter code for lysines is K. Okay, so you have six lysines all in a great string. Okay, and this forms what is known as a polybasic domain. So these six lysine amino acids all in a line is known as the polybasic domain of the KRAS4B uh, protein. Okay, right. Uh, so, let me show you the structure of lysine and then you'll see why this is called the polybasic domain. And then we'll discuss how having this polybasic domain is going to help the KRAS4B protein attach to uh, the plasma membrane. Okay, so let me show you the structure of a lysine residue. And again, I'll show it as a residue rather than as a free amino acid. So I'm drawing it as though it is within the polypeptide. So the amino group is here, and it's bound to the carboxylic acid group of the amino acid before this lysine. Here's the alpha carbon, and then here's the carboxylic acid group bound to the amino group of the amino acid prior to this lysine. Okay, now the R group of lysine consists of four methylene groups, and I think I'll draw them all out to emphasize the length of this amino acid. 
Okay, so we have four methylene groups, like so. There's the second, the third, and finally the fourth here. And then off the fourth methylene group, you then have an amino group, like so. Okay, now, I'm specifically drawing it in this way, rather than having the hydrogens coming off at a nice angle, because this nitrogen also has a lone pair of electrons on it. Okay, so this is the structure of a lysine amino acid residue, and the single letter code for that is K. Right, okay, so each one of these lysines on its amino group, right at its end here, uh, has a lone pair of electrons. Now, this lone pair of electrons here is a center of negative charge, so electrons are negatively charged. You have two electrons here, so that forms a center of negative charge, and basically, protons within the solution can come and associate with this center of negative charge because protons have a positive charge so they like to be near uh, negative charge so they can come and associate with this center of negative charge here now, even though this is the center of negative charge, the entire molecule was initially neutral. So if you've now shoved a proton onto the molecule, effectively, uh, you've made the molecule positively charged. And even what can happen is that these electrons can be pulled towards the proton, and effectively you can form a single covalent bond there, where the nitrogen provides both electrons into uh, the uh, bond, okay? And effectively, of course, the um, understanding of a covalent bond is that one electron comes from each of the uh, two members of the covalent bond. So if both electrons come from the nitrogen, then it's effectively like the nitrogen has given an electron to the hydrogen. So it's like the nitrogen gave one of its electrons to the hydrogen, and then the hydrogen used this electron that the nitrogen has just given it to form a covalent bond with the nitrogen. Okay, uh, so the positive charge becomes centered around the nitrogen. Okay, so. Um, this is why it's called a polybasic domain, because the lysine residues are capable of accepting protons, and the definition of a base is a molecule which is capable of accepting protons. So we've got six uh, groups here, all of which can accept protons, which is why it's called a polybasic domain. Poly means many, basic means uh, can accept protons. So basically you've got many basic amino acids, and that's why it's called this polybasic domain. Okay, now the significance of this is that all of these lysines, well, at least some of them, uh, are always, well, some of them at, at any one time, some of them will have protons associated with them, and some won't. So they, they're not always going to have protons associated with them. They'll be in a constant state of flux between having a proton associated and not having a state having a proton associated. So if you take a snapshot at any second, you'll find that some of them have protons associated and some don't, okay? But you'll always find some that have protons associated. So that means that this polybasic domain overall is going to have some positive charge, okay? It's not necessarily going to be six positive charges, but, you know, it might be two or three, okay, at any one time. And what this is going to mean is that the KRAS protein can associate with the uh, phospholipid bi there of membranes. So let me try and explain why. So if I now show you the structure of a phospholipid, Okay, so I'll show you the structure of a boring old normal old phospholipid. Okay, so here is my little cartoon of a phospholipid within a phospholipid bilayer, uh, which uh, the plasma membrane, the Golgi membrane, the nuclear envelope, uh, the ER membrane are all examples of. Basically, if I just highlight some of the key features of its structure, these two vertical lines, which I've now uh, coloured in orange, those represent the long-chain carboxylic acids, uh, which have been esterified uh, to the first and second alcohol groups of the glycerol molecule, which is the backbone for the entire phospholipid structure. Okay, so these are long-chain carboxylic acids. Okay, and they've been esterified to this glycerol molecule, which is this horizontal line in green here. So in green, this represents the glycerol molecule. And the proper name for glycerol is propane-123-triol. 
So, the chemist's name for glycerol is propane-123-trial, and although propane-123-trial is a mouthful, it's useful because it tells you exactly what we're dealing with here. It tells you that this molecule is a free carbon hydrocarbon, where you have alcohol groups coming off every single one of the carbons, and only one alcohol group coming off each of the carbons. Okay. Now, to the alcohol group coming off the first carbon, you have added a long-chain carboxylic acid via an ester link. To the alcohol group coming off the second carbon, again, you have added a, a carboxylic acid group uh, via an ester link. And to the alcohol group coming off the third carbon, you have added a phosphate group via a phosphoester link. Okay, so this pink ball here this is a phosphate group, and this is why it's called a phospholipid, whoops, phosphate group, okay? Uh, so, the long-chain carboxylic acids, another name for a long-chain carboxylic acid is to call it a fatty acid, okay? So, fats are another word for lipids, basically. So, this is why this is a phospholipid. So, this is the lipid component over here, and the phosphate group is the phospho component. Okay, now, phosphate groups have negative charges. They have a single negative charge, basically. So, both sides of the membrane, both this innermost side here and this outermost side here, okay, so let me highlight these. So, this portion here and also this portion here, they're basically centers of negative charge. You've got negative charge all over the place because of the phosphate groups of the phospholipids. Okay, now maybe you're understanding why having this polybasic region, which is positively charged, is going to help KRAS4B associate with the phospholipid bilayers. Okay, so if I draw a picture of a cell, Okay, so remember we've talked about these different uh, major organelles within the cell. So here is the nucleus, here's the endoplasmic reticulum again, and here's the Golgi apparatus. Okay, so currently KRAS uh, 4B is sitting within the membrane of the ER, okay, and it's implanted there by its pharmazyl group. Okay, but now it can leave this membrane, and for instance, it can go and attach onto the plasma membrane. Now, when it gets to the plasma membrane, firstly, it will stick its pharmazyl group into the plasma membrane, but also what helps it to uh, stay there is that it's got these, uh, this, these lysine uh, residues in the hypervariable region, which form this polybasic domain and which have a positive charge, and these will form electrostatic interactions with the negative charge of the phosphate groups of the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, and that helps to stabilize this KRAS4B uh, protein uh, binding to the membrane. Now, it doesn't find a bit of membrane and then stay there forever. This interaction is not the strongest interaction in the world, and it constantly cleaves, and the KRAS will come back off this membrane, and potentially it will go and stick onto the membrane of the Golgi, so maybe it will come over to the Golgi for a while, or it might go back to the ER and stick on the ER, but then it might go back to the plasma membrane, so basically it's constantly moving around. It's always within the cytoplasm, it never goes out of the cytoplasm, so it never goes into the extracellular fluid, and it never goes into the lumens of the ER or the Golgi, uh, but it can move between membranes basically, so it's not just positioned at the plasma membrane and that's it basically. It's got a more interesting life uh, than that. Okay, so uh, we're now going to turn our attention away from KRAS4B and we're going to talk about the other RAS proteins. So we're going to talk about HRAS, NRAS, and KRAS4A. Now, these all require an additional lipid molecule to be added onto them in order for them to leave the ER and uh, go to the plasma membrane. Now, also, what you should note about KRAS4B 
is that it moving from the ER to the plasma membrane was Golgi independent. It didn't involve the Golgi. Yes, it can go and bind to the Golgi membrane if it wants, but if we were to take the Golgi away, KRAS4B would still get to the plasma membrane, okay, which is going to be different for the other forms of RAS, oh, proteins. Okay, so... Uh, let's now talk about parmitorylation, specifically s parmitorylation of proteins, because this is going to be important for the other RAS proteins. So, let's have a reminder of the process of s parmitorylation. Okay, and remember there is another form of parmitorylation called m parmitorylation, but it's very, uh, well, it's much less common than s parmitorylation. And the form of parmitorylation that's going to occur to the RAS proteins is s parmitorylation. Okay, so let's start off with the structure of a palmitic acid molecule. So we'll start off with palmitic acid. Okay, so. Palmitic acid is the old biochemist name for a molecule that would be called by chemists nowadays hexadecanoic acid. Okay, and again, this name is more useful because it tells you exactly what it is. Palmitic acid could be anything. Hexadecanoic acid tells you that this is a 16 carbon, fully saturated carboxylic acid. Okay, so let's start off by drawing the carboxylic acid group here. Okay, and then it needs to have 16 carbons. We've done one already, so we need another 15. So, we're going to have 14 methylene groups. Now, I could face drawing out the four methylene groups of lysine, but I'm not going to draw out 14 of the things for palmitic acid. So, I'm going to draw, use a trick, basically. I'm going to draw brackets around a single methylene group and then subscript it 14 to mean repeat this 14 times. Okay, and then finally, you'll then have a methyl group on the end here. Okay, and some people would write a methylene group repeated 15 times and then they just put on the end a hydrogen. I prefer to put 14 methylene groups and then a methyl group on the end like that. And this make, takes us up to 16 carbons. So we've got two on either end and then 14 in the middle, that's 16 overall. So this is the structure of palmitic acid. Now, it's not palmitic acid that you're actually going to use in the process of s palmitoylation Instead, you're going to use a molecule known as palmitoyl coenzyme A. So, let me discuss the structure of this molecule, palmitoyl coenzyme A. Okay, and it's often just abbreviated to palmitoyl CoA. Okay, so CoA is short for coenzyme A. And this is the same coenzyme A that you see all the time if you study uh, the respiratory pathways. Okay, right. Uh, so, we're not going to go through the full structure of coenzyme A. Uh, instead, we're just going to abbreviate the whole thing to a box with CoA written in it. And the important functional group of coenzyme A is that you have a file group coming off it. So this is the only thing that's actually important about this molecule for our purposes, and really it's all you need to know in order to understand its role in the respiratory pathways as well. Okay, so um, basically what you're going to do is if we draw our palmitoyl group out again, you're going to form what's known as a phyoester link between the palmitic acid molecule and the um, coenzyme A molecule. Okay, so remember when we were talking about uh, farnesylation, I told you about how sulfur is a very similar atom to oxygen, okay, and it can form many similar bonds as oxygen would, okay? Uh, so, for instance, when we saw that thioether bond, it was effectively the same thing as an ether, but you had a sulfur atom linking the two carbons rather than an oxygen, okay? Basically, imagine for a moment that this is an alcohol group. So imagine this sulfur atom is an oxygen, okay? What you could do is you could form an ester link between this alcohol group here and this carboxylic acid group over here. So you would take off the alcohol group from the carboxylic acid molecule, you take off the hydrogen from the alcohol group, and you then bind the carbon to the oxygen. 
and you'd produce water from the alcohol group and the hydrogen. Okay, and this would form what's known as an ester link. Now it's exactly the same for sulfur. It's exactly the same, and this group here, in case I haven't emphasized this before, this is called a thiol group, and you can think of it as analogous to an alcohol group. Okay, so it's exactly the same. You can form an ester link, except that it's a sulfur atom here. And this sort of an ester link is not called an ester link, but is instead called a thioester link. Okay, so you form a thioester link between the palmitic acid molecule and the uh, coenzyme A. And it, the molecule that you then get is called palmitoyl coenzyme A. Okay, so you are going to use palmitoyl coenzyme A molecules to transfer a palmitoyl group onto uh, cysteine residues within a polypeptide. Okay, so let's say this is our polypeptide here. What's going to happen is you are now going to add palmitoyl groups onto cysteine residues within the Rouse proteins. Okay, and you're not going to do it to every single one, but certain cysteine residues are going to get palmitoylated. They're going to get palmitoyl groups added onto them. Okay, so uh, what's going to happen for initially, let's discuss HRAS. Okay, so we'll come to NRAS and KRAS4B in a moment. We've covered KRAS4, sorry, KRAS4A. We've covered KRAS4B. Uh, we've now got HRAS, NRAS, and KRAS4A left. We'll start with HRAS. HRAS, in order to move from the endoplasmic reticulum to the plasma membrane, only needs a single palmitoyl group added onto it. So it's going to be monopalmitoyl palmitoylated, I struggle with the pronunciation of that, monopalmitoylated, okay? So it requires a single palmitic acid molecule to be added onto a single cysteine residue within the protein. Okay, now, the cysteine residues that you pick for the palmitoylation will be within the middle of the polypeptide, okay? We're talking about S-palmitoylation. The other form of palmitoylation, N-palmitoylation, occurs if you've got a cysteine residue right at the beginning of the polypeptide. Okay, so remember all of our RAS proteins will have uh, cysteine residues right at the end once they've undergone the post-prenylation -pre uh, uh, modifications. Uh, but the cysteine residues that are now going to be palmitoyl palmitoylated are going to be in the middle of the polypeptide, okay? And that means that we're going to take part in S palmitoylation, whereas if they were at the beginning and had a free amino group, we'd do N palmitoylation. Okay, so S palmitoylation then, you're going to pick a cysteine residue that's within the middle of the polypeptide, so let's say this one here, that I've now highlighted in green, and you're going to add a palmitoyl group onto the thiol group of the cysteine residue. So, let me draw the structure of the cysteine residue out. So here's the amino group, here's the alpha carbon with the carboxylic acid group, which is then linked to the amino group of the next amino acid along. Okay, let me move it up a bit. And then the R group of a cysteine residue is then that you have a methylene group with a thiol group sticking off it here. Okay, now what you're then going to do is you're going to bring along a molecule of palmitoyl coenzyme A, okay? You're going to cleave the bond between the carbon and the sulfur of the um, palmitoyl CoA molecule, okay? So you're going to break the thioester link, and you're then going to break this bond between the sulfur and the hydrogen. Now, both of these are single covalent bonds, okay? So both of them contain two electrons. So imagine returning uh, the electrons to their original atoms. So return one electron in this bond to the sulfur and the other to the hydrogen. Return one of the electrons here to this sulfur and one to the carbon. Okay, now this is not supposed to be an electronic mechanism. This is just to make sense of the reaction. Now, take this hydrogen, which has a free electron, and bind it to this sulfur, which has a free electron, to regenerate the coenzyme A molecule. Then take this carbon, which has a free electron, and bind it to this sulfur atom, which also has a free electron. And this is how you're going to uh, palmitoylate your cysteine residue. Okay, so let me show uh, the palmitoyl group coming off over, well, coming over here. 
Okay, so here is the 14 methylene groups here, and then you have a methyl group coming off here. Now we've removed this hydrogen and we're now going to bind this sulfur atom to this carbon. And again, this is a thioester link because you had a thiol group originally here and you've now linked it to a carboxylic acid group. So this has formed a thioester link. Okay, and this is why it's known as S-palmitoylation because you are adding these palmitic acid molecules onto sulfur atoms, basically. So, what is going to happen to HRAS is that you're going to add a um, palmitoyl group, a single palmitoyl group, onto the protein. And again, it's going to happen within the hypervariable region. So it's going to happen very, very close to the terminal cysteine, which is farnesylated. Okay, so let's have this protein here. So here is the protein HRAS. Okay, and then right at the end, you then have the hypervariable region, which I'll show rather crudely like this. And then you have two lipid groups coming off this now. You have one farnesyl group, which I'll show in orange here. So this is the farnesyl group. And then you have one palmitoyl group, which I'll show in pink here. So you now have two uh, lipid molecules attached to your hypervariable region. Okay, and this is all happening in the ER, by the way. Okay, and I should mention that there is an enzyme needed to catalyze uh, this reaction, which is in the uh, membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. And that enzyme is a member of the DHHC family of enzymes, and we'll discuss those enzymes in the next video, and which enzyme catalyzes this specifically in the next video.